So with all that said, I'd like to introduce you to our speaker, Mr. Bob DeStefano. 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 I knew I was going to get it wrong. You almost had it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so uh, I have a, a slide here. Uh, Robert had a long bio. I didn't want to go through that whole thing. This is kind of a summary of my background. I've got about 42 years of experience in maintenance and reliability. Um, and um, 10 of that was in the nuclear power industry. I, I learned the reliability science there where consequences of failure were were unacceptable. And uh, it was a good place to, to spend my first 10 years. Uh, but I got tired of working for a Fortune 500 company and uh, I decided to start my own company. And I ran a company called MRG, which was a reliability consulting company for 30 years and sold that company to Emerson in 2014. Um, I retired at that time. And I, I must say, I, I was on the speaking circuit for many, many years and uh, never got nervous about that. But I'm, I'm rusty and I'm pretty nervous right now. <laughs> but I see I have some hecklers in, in this section right over here. And I don't know if I should be more nervous as a result of that or, or less nervous. But um, so bear with me and uh, I'll, uh, I'll try to go through my uh, presentation. My idea for the presentation which I developed, uh, what, four months ago, I guess, uh, was to, as a, a practitioner of maintenance and reliability, um, uh, lots of people, including many companies that I speak to now, oh, I, sh I should have said my current role, I came out of retirement to work for PCA. My dear friend, Dick DeFazio, who's here as the CEO of the company, this company has been very similar to the company I had, but it's been in business for 45 years and um, I'm the COO at PCA now. In that role, I've been talking to a lot of customers and many of them are getting approached by big companies that have digital transformation stories to tell. And a lot of executives included at these companies are expressing some uh, concerns. They're, they're, it's a little scary actually to hear these big uh, presentations of what digital transformation and digitalization could mean. Uh, to their companies. There's a lot of them that are pretty successful companies in lots of different industries are, are um, you know, trying to figure out what this means to their future and how it needs to change the way they do business. So I thought I would build a, 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 an agenda that, first of all, would define and demystify the terms that are being thrown about quite a bit. Um, and I'll give you a list of those terms. And I went to different dictionaries to look up uh, 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 definitions of these terms. I'm going to share those with you. I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, I'm not a digital expert. Um, given the fact that I was retired for a while, I kind of unplugged from the industry for five years until about a year ago. But I, I thought uh, it would be a good idea to, to educate myself. And so I, I did dictionary lookups for a lot of these terms. And I learned quite a bit. This is going to be very rudimentary. and We're not going to get deep into the technology, but uh, I think it might be helpful for, for some people that are like I was uh, struggling with this a little bit. Um, and then I'm going to talk about what, what seems to be next, what the visionaries are talking about as the, the next possible step in, in how we maintain our physical assets. Um, and it's actually something that has been talked about in the expert community for many, many years. The, the, the dream that many of us have had over the many years is starting to become a little bit more of a reality. And I wanna, I wanna describe that a little bit in very simple terms and high level terms. And then how does digitalization impact the, the, the workflow, the, the, the workflow of repairs that have to be done at industrial plants? Does it affect that at all? And if so, how, how so? And with the courtesy of one of my good friends, Tim White, who's sitting here, uh, who uh, has really done a good job of bringing a, a practical approach to digital uh, deployment in a company that he worked for uh, previous to his current role, um, I, I'm, I borrowed from him with his permission, a case study of uh, how this came together for him in a, a, a focused application of technology as opposed to a, a grand vision of digital transformation for a company affecting everything in the business. Let's keep in mind that digital transformation for some companies goes way beyond physical asset management and maintenance, right? 
it, 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 it goes into HR, it goes into finance, it goes into every aspect of, of the business. We're going to focus on the asset management impacts. And this case study, I thought, was an eye-opening one that uh, helped me uh, put some handles on all of this. And uh, with Tim's permission, I have four slides going through a case study of a, an equipment failure, uh, the history of how they deployed technology over the course of several years, and then how they dealt with that similar failure in the, in the future. And then I'm going to talk about some what I see as challenges and maybe some suggestions for those of you who are embarking on deployment of digital technology and a, a conclusion, my, my own personal opinion about uh, uh, you know, what, what this really all means. So that's the agenda. And I'm going to uh, try to step through this at a pretty good pace. So these are the terms that I want to spend some time defining. Um, a digital transformation, industrial internet of things, Industry four, artificial intelligence, machine learning, digital twins, predictive analytics, prescriptive analytics, and ITOT convergence. Uh, these are terms that I have been hearing bantered about quite a bit, and I, I didn't quite understand all of them, so I have some definitions for us. First one comes from Wikipedia. Not necessarily the most reliable source, but I actually went through a lot of of uh, re research to try to come up with a good definition of this. And it, it's really hard to define because it's a, uh, an all-encompassing term that means different things to different people. But I chose these two definitions and you could kind of read them for yourself. Uh, it's, you know, the, process, the, the, the top bullet talks about digital transformation in the global way beyond physical asset management and the bottom definition focused a little bit more on maintenance and reliability of physical assets and i thought it was um, you know fairly decent so the the bottom definition is that the digitalization of asset management uh, encompasses all elements of asset uh, the asset management pro process now if you look at those elements in the rest of that definition they're all very familiar aspects very familiar steps in a typical workflow for classical work management, right? Um, how can we deploy digital technology to enhance or improve each one of those steps? Those steps are familiar steps, but um, they're enhanced and enabled today in, in, uh, in by the deployment of these technologies. So digital transformation was a tougher one to define because again, it's such an all encompassing term. And, and different companies are branding their offerings using that term as well. And it means different things in different companies. So that one I had a little, little bit of a struggle with. Um, the industrial internet of things that is probably um, much more easy to define. Again, Wikipedia surprisingly turned out to have the best information of all of the sources that I, I polled. Um, and you know, this is the interconnected sensors and, and uh, instruments and other devices that we can network together and it, you know the the iiot basically had its birth many years ago in digital uh, uh, distributed control systems um and today with the cloud we, we're able to to take better advantage of those locally mounted sensors and and bring them into a an, an analytics platform so the industrial internet of things has it basically it enabled us to interconnect a lot of sources of information from different realms of the business. And those different realms are, I'm gonna talk about a little bit more in the next couple of slides. Uh, this term has been around for, for many, many years, as you all know. Industry four is, refers to the fourth industrial revolution, four IR um, or industry four as it's commonly referred to. This is basically just another evolution of the deployment of technologies um, to all different aspects of the business, but including maintenance and reliability. Um, so, you know, large scale uh, um, use of technology is um, kind of encompassed in this, this term called industry four. This had its roots in Germany, actually. And um, uh, it's... Um, uh, as well, I'm going to be repetitive, but it's a, it's the next generation of uh, use of technology to accomplish activities in companies. 
okay? I'm, I'm not gonna read these definitions word for word. You can read those for yourselves. Uh, artificial intelligence, um, two definitions here that comes from uh, Merriam-Webster dictionary, uh, a branch of computer science dealing with the simulation of intelligent behavior in computers. Um, I just said I wasn't gonna read all the descriptions, but these are short, I can read these. Um, and and the, the second definition is the capability of a machine to imitate uh, intelligent human behavior. So that's those are the definitions that I found the most succinct for artificial intelligence. Machine learning, um, this is the science of getting a computer to act without having programming done to tell it what to do in certain situations. Um, it's a very interesting and, and a, 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 um, a, a very current uh, aspect of digitalization that uh, um, more and more companies are using. We've, we've seen some interesting applications of this, even in simple things like scrubbing master data for an inventory catalog, uh, where uh, image recognition using photographs of uh, parts um, slowly but surely, as, as these images uh, continue to build in a library, they can, they can start making inferences from uh, what those images were meant, were, were prescribed to mean before, and learn that a, a different image that might look similar might actually have the same attributes. And so machine learning is, is putting computers to work to, uh, uh, to, to make, de make decisions basically and take actions without us having to have predicted what might happen and what we would want a machine to do in that, in that situation. Um, a digital twin, um, a virtual representation of a physical uh, installation in, in our world of physical assets. Um, these are used uh, to um, kind of represent without, without having to experiment with live equipment and risk um, you know, interruptions of product stream and so on. We can uh, play what if games in a computer uh, environment, a software environment and uh, redesign a tune uh, and, you know, and basically play what if games with different scenarios in a, in a non-risk environment. And that's what digital twin, there, there's a lot of applications for digital twins, but this is relatively new. And this was the definition that I, I, uh, I got for this one. Predictive analytics is closer to home for a guy like me, who's basically a, ma a maintenance hand and a reliability guy. Um, so we've had predictive technologies for many, many years, as we all know. Um, predictive analytics is taking advantage of information to, that has happened in the past history and, and helping us use that history to decide what might happen in the future. In, in rudimentary terms, using vibration analysis was a good way of us understanding that a machine may be on the verge of failing based on a vibration reading. And when we see that, that condition, it, it usually infers some action, action that might be necessary in the future to, pre, to prevent failure. Predictive analytics is, is going beyond um, just machine health information because now we have the ability to combine other uh, uh, um, uh, condition, other um, parameters, process parameters like pressures, temperatures, flows, and things like that with equipment health information that give us more context and a better uh, accurate prediction of what might be happening. I'm gonna get into that in a little bit more detail uh, in a few minutes. Prescriptive analytics, um, is slightly different. And this is one of the later evolutions of the technology deployment. And here we're, we're, we are uh, based on historical uh, parameters and conditions present right now. Um, we are now trying to say not only what might happen to the machine in the future, but what should we do about it, right? So if you think about a simple FMEA, a failure modes and effects analysis uh, for a particular class and subclass of equipment, 
it's kind of almost uh, in reverse, a troubleshooting guide to what might be wrong with that machine if one of those failure modes is detected. And so what are the remedies? What are the actions or the, the uh, activities that we would uh, do if we found uh, uh, an out of, an out of uh, alarm condition um, can be derived from some of these uh, um, uh, uh, failure hierarchies that are that exist. So if we if we have particular vibration, particular temperatures, and things like that, we we now have the ability not only to predict what might happen to that machine, but what should we do about it? If is is it a soft foot problem in a vibration situation? Is it a uh, a bearing problem potentially? Uh, is it a um, uh, something else? So pre prescriptive analytics is using the technology that we've had available for a long time, but now automatically without human intervention, prescribing an activity to go do that might involve automatic generation of a work request that might then go through a, a planning and scheduling process or might by bypass that planning and scheduling process. So different workflows could, uh, could uh, spawn from some of these uh, um, marrying up the knowledge of what we do when we find these conditions um, uh, with, with the knowledge when it comes about. This area here, uh, Tim helped me uh, understand and a couple of other trusted advisors that I've talked to from Emerson and GE and other big companies. I didn't understand the uh, challenges of, of basically con combining information that's at the plant level, unconnected to the corporate enterprise systems and protected for, for cybersecurity purposes and other reasons, um, and it, that those are, those are OT, operational technology networks that are used by the plants and fiercely guarded by the custodians and the owners of that information. It's always been a problem for us in maintenance to gain access to those uh, you know, the DCS information. Can we piggyback on your sensors to take advantage of pressures and temperatures and flows? Often the answer in my career was no, we can't risk allowing that those networks to be compromised with outside of this plant network. Um, so it's been, it's been a real challenge. And in, from the IT perspective, it's a different group of people that are taking care of those networks as well. And they, they have different goals and responsibilities. So um, uh, so th this has been the, when I, when I talked before about, we've been envisioning the use of all of this information to help us manage assets for quite a few years, at least 20, it's been just an idea in many, many experts heads. And w one of the impediments was the challenge of combining these two realms, these two organizations and, and, and helping them understand that they're that there is a way to do this without risking the, 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 the mission that each of them is responsible for. Uh, but I thought it would be good to start that discussion with defining the difference between the IT and the OT, the, the information technology networks and the operational technology networks. And you can think about, uh, I've listed the different kinds of things that operate in each one of those realms, right? Um, so the DCS system is a good example in a process plant that is often very, very closely guarded. And, and uh, we always had very, a lot of difficulty trying to get operations to, uh, to share that information with us and help us use that to, to, to build a better understanding of the condition of that machine and what should be done to it. Um, that's now starting to change. Um, this is a, a Purdue model that is quite old, but uh, I'm not an IT person, but I, what I've learned is that there's a, a whole language and a whole bunch of infrastructure related to the difference between IT and OT. And this gives you some examples of what falls in the OT versus the IT realm and, and what, what are the kinds of things that each one of those organizations is responsible for. Um, and this model has helped people in architecting systems for you know, many years. I believe this was invented in 1995, is that correct? So it goes back quite a long time. Um, and it, it helped me you know, get some understanding and framework of 
what is this big challenge? Why are they so resistant to share information with each other? And uh, it's not because they don't want to cooperate with each other. It's, it's because they fear risk of, of uh, mission interruption and each one of them has a different mission. Um, if we look at a standard um, best practices workflow, um, this is one, uh, you know, nowadays, you know, many, many people have the same model of what is a best practice workflow. And it, it includes, you know, in short, you know, a, a, a large influence on the daily work that gets done on the assets coming from uh, predictive maintenance and condition monitoring and less reliance on calendar-based PMs, time-based time interventions. So if you see the top here, a lot of the work that's, that's coming into the work management process, planning and scheduling and work execution, work order closeout and these feedback loops for continuous improvement is, is coming not from operators identifying a problem because that failure has almost already occurred, it's so noticeable now, but using more sensitive technologies to detect early warnings of impending problems with machines, and then giving the planning and scheduling work management process a chance to deliver its results, that is good productivity on the part of the maintenance workforce, right? Um, and you know, the, the question is, when did the digital transformation begin? Is this, is this some, something that's a recent development? And, you know, I, I'll argue that the introduction of predictive technologies was the beginning of, not really the beginning of digital transformation. You might go back further and say the first time we had CMMS systems come about, that was, that was the beginning of digital transformation. So we've been living with digital transformation and new technology development my whole career, um, it's not something that we should be afraid of. Um, the, the advent of uh, you know, these different terms that I defined earlier are making it infinitely more possible to be better and better at this. And, and the idea is to try to move up. This is very familiar um, diagram for most of you, I'm sure, you know, using these technologies to give the planning and scheduling practice a chance to deliver its results. Um, so you can see that if we, we can detect vibration, uh, we can detect a, a, um, a problem with the rotating machine long before you can hear it with the human ear or, uh, or uh, feel it to the touch, right? Same thing with infrared thermography, you know, before, if you can feel the heat, it's already a fairly advanced problem. And I see a lot of the technologies that we're talking about now coming about um, as continuing, continuing to move us up this curve. Um, 10 years ago, we, we talked to a company called Smart Signal, which was eventually acquired by GE. And uh, their vision was to use um, FMEAs that had been pre-built and good predictive technologies and marry those together so that they could man a central monitoring uh, um, command center for clients. And when they detected certain conditions, they would look for the FMEA for that failure mode and send uh, suggestions to the client. Uh, these are the kinds of things that you might be in store for. These are the kinds of work orders you should initiate versus saying, hey, you've got a problem on this machine, which was the state of the art at that time. And back then we were, we were dreaming that, is it possible that we can continue to find ways to move further up this curve? Is technology gonna give us that capability beyond, for example, vibration on a rotating machine? Can we combine pressures, temperatures, flows, et cetera, with, vibration and other, you know, oil condition to have a, 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 a more accurate predictive capability of what's happening to, the, to that machine and, and maybe have some automatic generation of activities that should be done versus having humans go out and troubleshoot and then come back and write a work request. And that's the way I see the latest advent of uh, digital transformation impacting the, the standard work management process. I don't think it's a scary, dramatic thing. Uh, when you think about digital transformation and you're talking to a CEO and we're talking about every aspect of the enterprise, 
That's a big, hairy discussion. But when we're talking about in our world of asset management, I don't think I, I'm coming to the to the comfort level now that this is manageable. And I have some suggestions about how to how to keep that, you know, manageable and how not to fall into some pitfalls along the way. Um, but it all comes back to, um, you know, this aspiration that we've been talking about comes back to converging these two worlds of IT and OT. And it's happening. And Tim here actually did this in a, a very focused way at a company he worked for. And I'm going to uh, share a case study. And Tim, if, if I say something that's wrong, I want you to correct me on this, because I think I understand this case study fairly well to, in order to be able to describe it. But help me with it if I, if I go off the tracks. So there was a, there was a critical asset in, in this plant where he, he was working in a company that had assets that were similar, distributed around the world. And... Uh, and uh, they were they had an aspiration to do digital transformation to improve uptime um, in in the company. They had a very very critical asset, a rotating machine, and uh, they had a high temperature alarm uh, on the motor, which was a water cooled uh, drive. Excuse me. They the vibration readings they investigated quickly were normal, so acoustic uh, readings were normal. What they did was they changed the motor. This was a big motor. It was expensive, $65,000. It took uh, 238 man hours of labor to change that motor. It's at a difficult to access location in the plant. And uh, it actually caused 96 hours of downtime, which had a significant uh, uh, impact on lost revenue, uh, over $2 million. Now, the company undertook an approach at about this time to start deploying technology and trying to marry up the IT and the OT worlds to, to try to get a better understanding of equipment conditions and have a better predictive capability. Uh, and they were doing this with uh, remote sensors from remote monitoring locations. So it was, a, it was a, bold, uh, a bold big step at the time when this was done. It was quite some time ago. Um, about a year later, while all this deployment was going on, they had the same temperature, high temperature alarm happen again. And um, different maintenance crew basically greased the bearing um, and the alarm silenced. And they thought basically that was the root cause of the problem. We just needed to have some lubrication done and they did and, and the alarm went away. But because they had deployed uh, uh, more information, more sensors, combined them and started to analyze what would it mean if these three things happened at the same time as that? What, what does it likely mean? They, they basically went back and looked at the historical uh, parameters that were happening when the second failure occurred. And uh, uh, they, were, they, they had deployed bearing temperature sensors and ambient temperature in the area uh, rotating speed, uh, vibration was something that had already been deployed. The cooling water temperature, they were monitoring in and out, inlet and outlet. So now they had a, hell, a heck of a lot more data uh, to, to, to play with. They found in looking back at that failure that the ambient temperature, um, at the ambient temperature that existed at the time of that failure, the bearing temperatures at that machine were running about 30 degrees higher than all of the sister-like equipment in the other locations. That was unusual. And that without this deployment of these additional sensors, they wouldn't have been able to figure that out. Um, now, once that bearing was greased, they returned the motor to 140 RPM, which is what it was supposed to be set to run at, although it was a very vari variable speed uh, driven piece of equipment. So um, it, it did vary in RPMs. Um, the high temperature alarm triggered when the, the, the rotating speed uh, increased to 160 RPM. Um, that was an interesting uh, find. And uh, after they had greased the bearing, as I said, they returned it to the normal speed and the, the alarm was silenced, right? Um, they also found that the bearing temperatures were only five degrees above what the set point was for the alarm. So um, that was kind of tight and a little another interesting finding. Uh, when, the bear, when the speed was increased to 180 RPM, this high temperature alarm would trip again. Okay. Now, 
when, when that happened, all of the individual readings and the alarms that each one of those was, was, was looking at were all normal. And it wasn't it, an individual sensor that gave them an indication of what the problem was. It was combining all of this information together and, and correlating it to, that eventually helped them uncover the root cause of the problem. Um, so if, if you, if, for example, if there was a bearing defect in, in that machine, which was, was what the reflex was of the maintenance department, vibration would have been high and that wasn't. Uh, the cooling water outlet temperature would have been high and it wasn't. Um, so in essence, using correlated multiple inputs of, of uh, parameters, they were able to discover that there was a simple signal converter that brought the signal from the sensor to the control room that was faulty and it was causing this high temperature alarm. And uh, all they had to do was really replace that sensor for 300 bucks. There was nothing wrong with the machine. There was nothing wrong with the bearing. And that would have saved, think about the two failures that we just talked about, especially the first one, a significant amount of not only downtime, but cost. So this is a, a nice little a succinct example of what we mean by convergence of the IT and the OT worlds and bringing all of those different inputs together. With, with wireless technology today, it's a lot more economical to be able to do this. When I was still uh, you know, in the thick of my practice, you know, it was very expensive to put sensors out there because wires and conduits had to be run and, and it was prohibitive. You only did it on highly critical equipment back then. Now that's all changed. And that's another aspect of digital transformation, right? Wireless technology has made a lot of this stuff much more practical. Um, did I go off the rails on it at all? Can you correct any of that? I nailed it. Okay, good. <laughs> I had a good coach. So, so I'm, I'm basically suggesting that we've been involved in digital transformation my whole career. I started my career in 1978. And, um, you know, we were, we were one of the first nuclear plants to put in a computerized maintenance management system. We had the old index cards in the bins for PMs and for parts and BOMs and stuff like that. So that was digital transformation, wasn't it? And how, how is, is, you know, the, the new technology going to impact our work management process? I'm going to also suggest that somebody still has to pick up a tool and go out and fix a broken piece of equipment. You know, the, 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 the lowly maintenance guy in the hourly ranks, their job is maybe going to change because they're going to get better planned work orders and there's going to be a better understanding of what's wrong before they get there. But still, but we're not going to replace those. We're not going to, like we are able to do in some operations where robots can do humans jobs in assembling or building equipment. That's not going to be the case in maintenance. We're still going to need, you know, humans to go out and repair equipment, no matter how we figured out there was something wrong with the equipment. And if there's something wrong with the equipment, we're not we're not waiting for it to fail catastrophically when we have no time and we're in a reactionary mode to repair it. We're wanting to get to the place where we've got very, very long advanced notice based on all these technologies. And so therefore we can convert from a reactionary to a proactive maintenance mode. After all, isn't that what we've all been striving to do for a long time? These technologies are just going to help us do that a little bit more easily, I think. And, and I, it, it, it's a pretty simplistic view of it. But I mean, I, I, I hold that, that, you know, I, I'm not afraid of it, really, this exercise that I went through to, to, to try to learn a little bit, I'm, I'm not going to become a digital expert. And I'm, I'm not one today. And I won't be one. I'll be re retired again before I have to do that. Um, but um, I, th this is how I see the development, the advent of technologies in our world in, in physical asset management. Uh, the challenges are, are interesting ones. One that, that uh, we've been struggling with for a long time is that the, the, the tags for all of the sensors for temperatures, pressures, and flows live in a different system, and they don't necessarily organize themselves into a hierarchy of equipment. So we have tags for temperatures and flows and so on that are in the DCS system, for example, in a process plant, and they're not related to a particular piece of equipment necessarily. If I wanna understand inlet and outlet flows and temperatures of a particular piece of equipment, I've gotta cross-reference all of those points in the censoring 
deployment to my physical assets. And that's a, a bit of a challenge that has to be done. It's doable. I don't think it's, a, it's an insurmountable task at all. Uh, but I think that's one of the challenges that has to be overcome. Uh, we also have this whole, these two organizations that have had, you know, somewhat at odds missions that have to be reconciled. And I think Tim was able to accomplish that in his company. I've seen other companies do that in small focused applications, as opposed to looking at it at, a, at an enterprise level and, and uh, you know, just taking one bite at a time out of, out of the elephant is uh, a, a, I think a better approach and, and, and learning the technology as you go on a smaller scale and, and eventually then growing that as you, as you go. So it could be overwhelming. We're seeing a lot of our customers, including at the C level, uh, come to us and ask us questions about what does this mean to our company? Is this something we need to be worried about? What should we be doing? They're doing research right now. They're trying to figure it all out. And uh, what I try to do is ju just bring some handles and, and uh, put, it, put some practical terms to it. So uh, I, that's, that's my conclusion. Um, you know, take it for what it's worth. Uh, it's, a, it's a simple view. Uh, but uh, I think our business is still pretty simple. I mean, I, I don't think there's a lot, there's a lot of, um, uh, we, don't, we don't need to make it more sophisticated and more, I, I like to keep it simple. And I think it is a simple business, really, physical asset management. Now, now we have better tools to be able to do this better. That's the way I look at it. So with that, do we have any questions? <laughs> Yes, sir. Here I come. Here I come. Here I come. This is a good example of you using this approach to deal with a, a known problem. Uh, you mentioned earlier the, the ability to look ahead. Are you doing any applications where, um, for instance, say um, you're avoiding the problem in the first place? You know, uh, I think from an operation standpoint, you know, well, you get alarms when the tank runs over, you know, when the pump's shaking too bad, but uh, there's also process data and sensor data that tells you, hmm, if I go that direction, I'm going to damage my equipment. Have you done any of those kind of applications? I think so, yeah. Uh, Tim, do you have, do you have anything to, to add to that question? The short answer is yes. You're so the, the short answer is yes. Um, the tank overflowing and tripping an alarm, or even in this case, the in the use case that Bob showed us um, with bearing temp, the models that um, those guys built, they tell you when that alarm is going to go off, right? Um, and also things such as, okay, we've got a problem with this equipment and um, with a defined probability, this is how long you have until you're gonna be broken in pieces on the floor, right? So where applicable, sometimes we also can recommend adjust your operation to this parameter to lengthen the, the period of time because sometimes it may say you're going to die on Friday and I don't want to fix it on Friday. I would rather wait till Monday. <laughs> right. So uh, it helps guys make decisions like that as well. Yeah. Um, it's, it, no, it's absolutely dynamic. I won't steal any more of your questions. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, we're fairly new into uh, using like wireless sensors, vibration, stuff like that. And just one of the things I noticed um, is sort of a problem for us is actually our technicians, our, our electric technicians going out to our equipment, uh, pumps and motors. Um, and during their routine maintenance, stuff like that, actually interfering with them, knocking them off, not seeing that. So is there sort of any, do you, do you see that with other people? And I don't, I don't know if we're going to a world where it's like PMs on top of the PMs for, you know, those, those sensors, wireless 
stuff, more of the, the IT stuff from the technician side where they're going to have to check these things um, and, and how to sort of handle that. Um, and, and that can go into a long list of things with it, it throwing, we're going to, we're going to throw out a work request because a sensor went off. Um, and now we have to check the sensor sort of situation. We're kind of adding, adding on to that as, and we're even getting into the, you know, the world of, you know, those firmware upgrades on, on those sensors and, and IOT equipment. Um, so was, do you see something like that or, you know, training for technicians going forward more in the IT realm of things? Well, I, I hadn't thought of that last part of your comment, but I think that probably makes sense. What, what, what I was thinking about as you were asking the question was there are um, the different qualities of the sensors that, uh, that cost different amounts of money. Um, so some, some of that may be uh, a matter of quality of the actual hardware, um, and, but training you know, operators not to interfere with those sensors is, or, or maintenance people particularly is going to be probably important. I hadn't thought about that actually. We, we haven't run into that. I have to admit most of our customers have not a, a, a robustly deployed this technology yet. It's still somewhat exploratory for most of the customers. So I haven't had any customers come back to me uh, to complain about this, hey, this new problem now. Um, have you guys, uh, anybody else experienced any of that? Yes, sir, back there. Yeah, we at uh, Augury actually make these sensors and sell them, so we deal with it a lot. Um, good, good. One thing that our customers do appreciate, though, is that you know we've taken ownership of the sensors, so we have our own IoT team to monitor the sensors for them. Um, that way, they don't have to be checking on the sensors. Um, it's kind of part of our subscription package, but it is a real problem that uh, everyone's going to be dealing with as we put sensors on everything. So, interesting. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I think. So maybe that's something to consider outsourcing that uh, and not having to train your internal people. I don't know. It's good. That's a good question. So Bob, I'll say that um, for our utility, we have coal plants and at coal plants, they spray everything down with a fire hose. So in looking at um, um, deploying remote sensors, the first thing we ask is, is it watertight? And how tight can you put it on equipment? Yep. So yes, we are those people where you have to worry about are they gonna <laughs> are they gonna interfere with the with the instruments? But are, but are you are you resolving that though, Robert? We we're still scared. So <laughs> okay. Okay. so we haven't we haven't really deployed it yet. However, we're looking at we're still looking into it. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. We, we got one uh, from the virtual chat here. Um, do you know of any sensors that are small, durable, and can withstand cleaning and sterilization for medical equipment that is required to be sterile before every use? I, I can't answer that question, and we'll get an answer for you if, if someone, I don't know if you guys have an answer to that question. I'll get an answer for that question and, have, and get it back. Do you have the identity of the person that asked? I, that? Yes, it's uh, available. It, you can see it on the app. Uh, okay. I'll show you. All right. Perfect. This. I'll, yep. I'll come see you after that. We'll get an answer for that. I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. I just want to hear you. So is there a specific platform for doing IT OT convergence? Is, is there something that works better than another? especially if you have very diverse systems between those two, is there something that marries better than another? I, I'm, I'm going to defer to Tim on that question. What you're looking for is a data historian. There's several levels of, uh, or several, several, applications that are offered out there some you know with investigation you can find the one that fits what you need uh, a lot of it depends on what's the language that the dcs can communicate out with the most common um frameworks right now are opc da and opc ua are real common mqqt is also another language protocol that has become very 
common with the advent of the um, new IIoT sensors. So my recommendation would be is if you want to search those out, um, figure out what your business requirements are, and then use that to pick what the data historian is going to be. Um, I would also encourage you to look at its ability to collect at whatever rate that you need. So am I collecting data once a minute? Am I collecting data once a second? What do you need, right, to hit your end goal there? Offline, I'll be happy to talk to you about some stuff, but I'm here to, <laughs> I'm not gonna endorse software right this second. <laughs> Good, thank you, Tim. And Tim works for TA Cook, by the way. Um, if you need to contact him. So, Bob, I love how you give a presentation, how you tell a story, and it really, really kind of captures the imagination. And I find myself kind of thinking about, you know, you talked about predictive analytics, and, you know, we, we introduced condition monitoring a while back. I'm sitting here kind of, my mind's going to the craftsman, right, that's getting requests to go out and do work, right? And in the days when we introduced predictive technologies, you know, there was a little bit of some hesitate, you know, do I believe I really need to go change that bearing? Do I need, you know, should I, do I really need to go do this? My question is, do you anticipate some of the same, not pushback, but maybe disbelief or how do we educate the craftsmen now when we're using IIoT and prescriptive analytics and, and a lot of this information from sensors and from that that says we ought to be going and doing this now when they're really still not seeing the downside that that's really declining. Any thoughts around how to help today's craftsmen get on board with that and believe and is that something we need to be thinking about addressing? I think so, Doug. Um, I, I would argue that the larger challenge in the, the ranks of the plant personnel is in the operations department versus the maintenance technicians. I, I remember many, many years ago deploying, you know, predictive technologies and the operators are saying, you're not getting my equipment. You know, there's nothing wrong with that piece of equipment. They, they don't understand the technology, but whoever the constituency is that needs the culture change, I think education is a big part of, as you know, right, Doug? I mean, uh, but, but I would say directed at the operators. I think the ice has been broken though with, you know, th there's a, a, a much deeper, under, a broader at least understanding of these technologies, the vibration, temp, you know, infrared and lubrication, the three top ones that have been around for so long. Uh, operators now understand those better and they're more inclined to trust, even though I don't see or smell or feel anything wrong with that machine. Um, so I think it's gonna be easier to, to help them get to the acceptance level. That's my personal opinion. We haven't really crossed that bridge yet in our practice, but um, it's a good insight that we should be anticipating that, that need, I think, because we don't have any deliverables right now to address that part of the culture change, right? Um, so a, that's a good insight. You know, culture change is always the biggest impediment. To, it's not the technical answer. That, that part has always been the easiest right? It's getting the people to change the habits. And that's, that's always been the hardest part of it. I think that won't be any exception here. But I do think it's easier because I think this is an incremental step. It's not a whole new world. You know, we've, we've at my, I'm trying to argue that we've been doing digital transformation for a long time now, really, if you step back and think about it. <laughs> 